thank you so much for joining our, our Uncle Fertility webinar today. We're very pleased today to host Dr. Sherman Silver, who, as you all know, is a worldwide pioneer in reproductive medicine, surgery, and fertility preservation. Today, Dr. Silver will give us a webinar on the topic of ovarian tissue crowd preservation, as well as transplantation. And he'll also touch upon simple, simple robust in, in vitro maturation. The webinar itself will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions. Please, during the presentation, keep your mic muted and your camera turned off throughout the webinar to avoid noise and to ensure a smooth transition of the webinar broadcast. If you have a question, please post it in the chat. We will open the discussion at the end of the webinar with the ability to turn on your mic and camera to ask questions. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded afterwards to our YouTube channel. So thank you all, we're very excited. Um, I'm joined um, by um, Dr. Orwig and um, Dr. Salama as co-moderators. Uh, do I start now? Okay, so I just thought I would, uh, in first place, it's a pleasure to be here. I. Uh, I've missed a few of the meetings because of COVID and, a, and an error in our email. Uh, and it, this is a fantastic society and it's just what the most important way of bringing everyone together and this issue of fertility preservation, particularly for cancer patients. I just thought this was funny to start. There, there is so much junk in the literature and so many crazy ideas we're hearing in the IVF world that are, patients are coming back with from various doctors uh, and they're pontificating without evidence. So I'm trying to keep everything I do evidence-based, but I think this is a riot. The king is saying to his wife, who obviously is quizzical, based on the feedback from advisors whom I haven't beheaded yet, all of my ideas are great. <laughs> we hope we're not gonna follow that approach. Now, uh, what I'm gonna, we started out with ovary transplantation in 1997, the first freezing of ovarian tissue in our center. And it really began with Roger Gosden's seminal paper in 1994 in The Sheep. And uh, it's led to in vitro maturation and really understanding much better how the ovary works. I'm gonna point out today that in vitro maturation shouldn't be difficult. It's incredibly robust. and. Um, and they, we've learned about this from uh, the work by uh, Hayashi, who is collaborating with uh, Kyle and with Amanda Clark and me on in vitro gametogenesis. We really understand the ovary much better now. So all this is tied together and I have too many slides, but it doesn't matter because all of these subjects relate to each other. IVM and in vitro uh, ovogenesis, the whole mystery of ovarian longevity, frozen ovary transplantation results, Ovary allotransplantation for Turner syndrome is now possible, and even skin biopsy to make eggs in the human. Cannot discuss this all in one talk, but they all work together. Now, I want you to think about this slide that I made and put together based on Hayashi's work and then modifying it for the human. And if you understand this one slide, you, you'll understand why IVM should be so robust and, and what we've done over the previous years in the human that has made it actually not work. It's so easy to make it work, but we've always made it not work. So there's a period of in vitro differentiation, which I'll explain to you more when we get into summarizing some of Hayashi's work. And that's called IVD. In the mouse, that period is about three weeks where the, uh, the um, uh, PGCs are incubated with uh, fetal granulosa cells. In the human, uh, it's a little different, but it's, it's lasting four months. And that's the fetal uh, sensitization has already occurred a long time ago. And this is the period from primordial follicle where there is no gonadotropin sensitivity until the uh, oocytes are actually sensitive to, in, to uh, gonadotropins. And I actually call that IVG. And it's the same in vitro as in vivo. And uh, it's remarkably 11 days in the mouse, just like it's 11 days in the human, quite remarkably. 11 days uh, is the ideal time of, uh, based on I, uh, in vitro work of gonadotropin sensitivity before the oocytes are ready to mature to M2 oocytes. 
And so you'll understand this in a bit better, but just understand there are 11 days of IVG. And uh, if four of those days uh, are all, like day seven to day 11 are all you need uh, to be sensitive to HCG or the LH surge, four out of 11 is 35%. And, and so you can almost predict that there would be a 35% maturation rate of GVs obtained from ovarian tissue. It's, it's very robust. So we'll go a little further. And if it goes too far beyond that sweet spot of uh, four to seven days, these are post-mature. They've had too much gonadotropin exposure and, and they're just gonna degenerate when you put them in culture with IVG. I want you to see these videos. They'll tell you a lot about the progress. There's in never been any doubt in my mind that I would get, you know, get the cure to this. I just, once I found out, I just made up my mind. That's it. You have to, you just have to keep taking it one day at a time and just, just keep that positive attitude and know that I can do this. I, I will, I'll go through it. So eight o'clock in the morning, uh, July 17th, 1997. We're at uh, St. Luke's Hospital. And uh, we're about to do the first case uh, in the St. Louis area of ovarian tissue freeze. <laughs> okay, well, I'm uh, Dr. Silver, Sherman Silver, the Infertility Center of St. Louis. And we really have a treat right now. Uh, this is Jennifer, who at 24 years of age, I'm right on that, came down with a terrible case of leukemia. Uh, we thought she was going to die, uh, but just to be safe, in case she lived, <laughs> when she did, <laughs> and was cured, uh, we would freeze her ovarian tissue. So that was like 20 years ago. And uh, this is the first case that we ever did, and we're the only ones right now really actively with a program in the whole United States. And uh, it's been a long time and we didn't know that we'd be able to transplant the tissue back and we didn't know if we could culture the tissue. And here she is now, we, we had her on Facebook Live a uh, several months ago. Uh, she was happily pregnant and uh, now look what we have. Now she's 20, she's 44 years old, I can reveal that, with a 24 year old ovary. And a uh, beautiful baby. What's her name again? Madeline Grace. Madeline Grace. Now, this is the second case that I wanted to show you. The very second one we did. Dr. Sharon Silver, Infertility Center of uh, St. Louis. And I'm here with the most amazing fertility story ever. This is Amy Tucker. I've known her since she was a little 19 year old girl <laughs> who was facing death with uh, Hodgkin's disease, a terribly difficult case. And uh, she's uh, got two children from her frozen uh, ovary that we froze uh, uh, before she underwent uh, her chemo or bone marrow transplant that sterilized her. And she's now pregnant with twins. <laughs> going to wind up having four children uh, from this ovary we froze uh, before she had this uh, uh, life-threatening cancer and was treated for it. Here's the last one I'll show you. This is the third case we did. The fact that I couldn't have children <sighs> really scared and frightened me. Two years ago at the age of 21, Melissa was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. She was told her treatment would include very high doses of chemotherapy. I thought, I'm young, I can do it. The odds are looking really great for me. Hodgkin's lymphoma, very curable. And then I really started looking into my papers and my books that you get, and I came across fertility, and I burst into tears. I don't have a biological clock anymore. He took it away from me. <laughs> so when I'm ready to have kids, it's not going to be a problem. Well, Melissa, this is a fantastic moment for, for all of us. I mean, I, when are you going to have the baby? We are scheduled for a week from yesterday. So six, six more days. Six more days. And you look really ripe. I am very ripe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
this is, uh, uh, I wanted you to just see those, but we have so many cases. Uh, those are the first three we did. And it, it's often not until uh, 20 years later that they come back to have the tissue transplanted. So it's very hard for people doing ovary tissue freeze now to have any kind of results for, for many years until the patient comes back. So the way we do it though, it, we're very careful microsurgically. We quilt the thaw tissue together until it's just one piece and not just several pieces. And we always make sure to transplant it orthotopically right to where the, so to speak, dead ovary is on the other side. And uh, we make sure that the fallopian tube can reach it easily. We make sure there's no adhesions uh, that prevents uh, ovary egg pickup because it's much, it's much higher success rate if they get pregnant naturally with spontaneous ovulation than if you try to do IVF with these transplanted ovaries. So this is just a, a quick summary of uh, the cases that have come back and, and had their transplant back. And as you can see, we have 19 babies with, it's a 76% uh, success rate uh, with uh, at least one baby from the transplant. And it really doesn't matter whether you use vitrification or slow freeze, they're both equally successful. Now, I just wanna point this out to emphasize that leukemia is not a contraindication. And I will explain a little bit later on, and you'll understand. If they've already had their first round of chemo prior to their bone marrow transplant, there are likely to be no cancer cells in the ovary cortex. I can explain to you why later, but uh, so we can transplant the tissue. Now, what if they haven't had their first round of uh, chemo? Well, then we can do IVM and it'll work. If they've had a round of chemo, IVM isn't gonna work, but the ovary cortex is safe to transplant. If they've had no first round of, uh, of, of uh, chemotherapy, then I'd be afraid to transplant the tissue back, but the IVM will work then. So, so far we have six babies from uh, three women with uh, leukemia. And if we add up all results with frozen over, even from the fresh transplants we did originally with identical twins, we have a total of 13 healthy babies and none of them really were from IVF. So what's, what started this originally uh, was this unusual series of identical twins, discordant for ovarian failure. And it's funny in research how one interesting result, if you keep your eyes open and communicate and collaborate with enough people in the field, uh, can lead to an incredible dispersion of knowledge. So this is interesting first case. Crystal's eggs were quite fertile until she was 46 years of age, and I'll show you that. But Bonnie was born with no eggs. And the big question we always had is why? We had 10 patients like this. Why would one identical twin that's genetically identical uh, have uh, normal ovarian reserve, like she was for, her eggs, her ovary was good till she was 46, and one of them would have been born with none. And uh, in fact, we transplanted the, that tissue from Crystal to Bonnie when she was 38 indeed. But here at 46 years of age, uh, Bonnie uh, now has three children, her last one at age 46, uh, just from that transplant from her identical twin sister. So um, uh, now, in fact, now at age 55, I'm getting ahead of the story, we, 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 we have from her skin, biopsy at age 55, we have uh, good quality germ cells, PGCs in the human. So here was the question that started our collaboration going with Amanda and with uh, Katsuhiko. If the reason for discordancy for ovarian failure in identical twins is misallocation at the time of splitting, we could determine in the human embryo when germ cell specification occurs just by looking at the obstetric history. And if we could generate germ cells from skin biopsy derived IPS cells of these women, that would rule out an epigenetic or genetic error causing the POI, leaving the only explanation by exclusion to be germ cell misallocation at the time of splitting. And if it is germ cell misallocation at the time of splitting, then we can figure out at what stage of embryonic development does germ cell specification occur in the humans. So this, this was how we started the so-called CHOSE project. Uh, and uh, 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 it's uh, a combination of work with, uh, you can see Kyle Orwig there. You can see Katsuhiko Hayashi 
you can see Amanda Clark and you can see the short one there is me. And we're working all together uh, to uh, eventually try to convert skin cells into fertile oocytes in the human. Uh, that was when I first started working with Katsuhiko. Actually, it was before this, because I was also trying to understand uh, what, what, what it is that determines ovarian longevity. Uh, and, and that question came up because of the longevity of these little bits of tissue uh, that we transplanted back to the ovary that had very low AMH and still lasted for up to eight years. And uh, also, from the change in hormones post-operatively in these women, uh, I, I, had a, I was convinced that pressure had to be the controlling factor in primordial follicle recruitment and, and not anything hormonal. And uh, Katsuhiku helped prove that. Here, here he is with Ori Hikabi, who is his uh, uh, postdoc, who actually did all the work for the paper originally in which he converted uh, uh, skin cells from the uh, mouse tail into oocytes and came up with healthy baby mice uh, with the, that developed just from the mouse mother skin cells and not from oocytes. And this is Amanda Clark, who uh, is, uh, uh, Katsuhiku chose her as the best person to work on applying this to the human. And Amanda was the person in, uh, introduced to me actually by John McCary. Uh, who we first talked about the issue is how can we find out when germ cell specification occurs? Is there some way we can use these identical twin cases to find that out? So the actually overall show's project, which includes uh, Katsuhiko and Kyle and, and me, uh, in the mouse first make iPS cells from skin cells from the mouse's tail. The iPS cells are then transformed to PGCs. Incubate these PGCs with fetal granulosa cells. You cannot use adult cells, they'll just die, to get fully competent oocytes in normal baby mice. I mean, that's one of the tricky things. You need fetal granulosa cells, not adult granulosa cells, to transform those PGCs into competent oocytes. So, applying this to the human, we now have many beautiful PGCs derived from a simple skin biopsy of menopausal women. But now we need to make human fetal granulosa cells. So this is how we do it. Uh, these, either with azospermic men uh, or with postmenopausal women, we would do a simple punch biopsy. Hardly anything to it. They all volunteered and we'd send that to Amanda. And this is the very first paper on it. Uh, the subsequent paper that all the details took a long time to be accepted and finally has been. But this was the first proof of concept where this 55-year-old woman who was previously fertile and menopausal now uh, for uh, seven years, uh, generated young PGCs from 55-year-old skin cells. And we were able to actually answer the question, uh, roughly at least, of when uh, the, uh, there is a germ cell specification in the early embryo, because we knew the mother's history of these identical twins. And they were all monoamniotic, uh, monochorionic uh, twins. And so, we know that that occurs, that the splitting had to occur between nine and 12 days. If it was more than 12 days, they would have been uh, Siamese twins. If it were uh, less than nine days, it would have been uh, monochorionic, uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but not monoamniotic necessarily. So mono, mono has to be between nine and 12 days. And we're simply replaying early embryonic formation of embryos. That's where PGC specification occurs in the early epiblast. And it has to separate, uh, as John McCary explained, from the rest of the embryo, because the rest of the embryo is going to undergo somatic differentiation at a mad pace. And so these PGCs, they're not PGCs yet, but they're specified to be PGCs, have to be specified and migrate away from the rest of the uh, somatically differentiating embryo. But think of this, when all we're doing and all Katsuhiko is doing is replaying early embryo, very earliest embryology. So think about this, oocytes generated in vitro from iPS cells will be very young. So possibly in the future when this is protected, pre I mean perfected, a 38 year old woman with somewhat old eggs might be better off having a skin biopsy than an oocyte retrieval for IVF. 
pretty astounding. Uh, Amanda feels this is really going to be possible in five years, but on the other hand, um, uh, just uh, uh, regulatory approval could take another 10 years after that. So let's just talk about in vitro maturation, which is the immediate practical thing. Uh, and the in vitro maturation that is so simple just, just occurred. We developed it just because we stopped doing all the wrong things because it's just almost natural if you understand in vitro gametogenesis. So it's all based on in vitro oogenesis in the mouse. That's how we understand IVM. So this is how we do it. So we take out the whole ovary for any cancer patient wants to preserve their fertility or for any other reason. And uh, we don't think it's a good idea at all to take out just portions of it to do a partial oophorectomy because it's easier to dissect. And studies from Yasui et al. a long time ago and from Klaus Anderson showed that if you take out one ovary, even in a normal woman, it's going to make her menopause occur only one and a half years earlier, uh, 49.5 instead of 51.0 years of age, and it will have absolutely no effect on fertility. So especially since the other ovary is, is going to be killed anyhow by the uh, chemo and the radiation, uh, we take out a whole ovary and we leave the other ovary intact to be a resting place to put the ovary graft in the future. So this is what's shockingly simple. You can do this tomorrow and, and I guarantee it'll be successful. Any ordinary IVF culture media, you don't need IVM media, nothing specially expensive, just ordinary IVF, any IVF, IVF culture media. The usual human serum albumin, which is not a big deal, 10 milligrams per milliliter. And then you can use 150 milli IU of HCG per ml or any other concentration. And you can add 150 milli IU of FSH or any other concentration. It doesn't matter. I'll show you in a minute. Then you could also just use Minapure, which is kind of ridiculous because there's only 10 milli IUs uh, per ml of HCG and 75 of FSH. How in the world can that work? But it works. So first we'll show you how we do the dissection. The most important thing is to realize that if we're trying to do IVM by sticking a needle into these follicles, we can see on ultrasound or even with our own naked eyes, we're not going to get very many uh, oocytes. We're not going to get many follicles to empty. But if we're dissecting the cortical medullary junction and then look in the me spent media for oocytes or for GVs, that is, we'll find many of them, anywhere from 10 to 100 of them. And this is the way we dissect it. We dissect it now the way Roger Gazin originally said we should. We had switched to just a simple dissector for taking off the ovary cortex, and that works fine for vitrification. But frankly, if you want to get GVs for IVM, you have to do it with the original Gosden method. And actually, you can thin the Gosden method out so much that you, you make the tissue thin enough, it's still good enough to vitrify. So we still do all our freezing with vitrification, even though we're not using a vitrification slicer. And uh, so you see, it, it's very, very thin. You can see the little divots where developing follicles were uh, throughout, but then we cut it into various pieces for vitrification. And, and this, they shouldn't be more than one centimeter by one centimeter by one millimeter square, because if it's any more volume than that, you will slow the rate of cooling and that will make the vitrification procedure not very effective. So it's very important, not just the thinness of tissue, but the total volume of tissue. So don't do two centimeters by one centimeter by one millimeter. We actually tried that stupidly and we found out the volume is very important. So those are the pieces of tissue we're going to vitrify. But we're not done with that. Now we look through the spent media in the large Petri dish where we did the dissection. And, and that's where we will find the, uh, uh, you know, the cumulus complexes that contain the GVs. And take a look at this. This is what they look like on histology. Now this one histologic slide will show you why you cannot get these GV oocytes very well uh, just with a needle, with the classic way we try to do IVM. You have to be dissecting the cortical medullary uh, junction in order to really get these things because they're not gonna, you're not going to get a needle in them. And they contain 
really good GV oocytes. Obviously, the oocyte is not on the stalk yet because that doesn't happen until the HCG effect and the maturation to M2. So you're not going to be able to stick a needle in and get very many of these. Even if you stuck a needle in this successfully, since it's not out on a stalk, you're not going to get very many of these uh, GVs. But we get a lot of them. And this is what the cumulus complexes look like. And uh, after culture for a day, you have normal M2 oocytes. And you can look two days later and you have more M2 oocytes. Now you have uh, M1s also, uh, and you have the persistent GVs, and you have DGENs, as you can see, they're up on top. And I'll explain to you in a minute why there is this variety of perfectly normal M2s along with DGENs and remaining GVs and you only get 35%, which is fantastic to uh, mature. So first, let's just look at this uh, table. We have many more now. This is the first 13 cases, but I mean, we're over 20 now, and it's always showing the same thing. In one case, we stripped the cumulus immediately because uh, Hayashi and I were wondering how important the cumulus is once you get that GV out. And it's obviously still important because we only had uh, 9% uh, or really one out of 11 of those cumulus complexes develop into M2s. But, but the patient was fine because we, we had plenty of ovary tissue slices to uh, freeze. But look at uh, the FSH and HCG and look at the culture media base. Quinn's cleavage, Medicult IVM, uh, Sage IVM, more Quinn's cleavage. We, we, it didn't matter what media we use. Look at the variations in concentration. I mean, it, as low as 10 milli IU of HCG, which was in Minapure, gave us a 48% IVM rate. <laughs> and uh, Katsuhiko uh, did as many as 1200 milli IU per ml. So our biggest one was 1000 milli IU per ml. And that did not increase the maturation rate. In fact, it was only 19%. But there's going to be a variation and a fluctuation, but we certainly always average uh, 35%. If we look at just a, the same data, just a, a few columns taken out so it's easier to read, you can see the IVM rate is pretty good, 48%, 67%, 20%, 29%, 38%, 36%, 38%, 35%. Uh, we average 35% uh, uh, successful uh, maturation. Now, let's compare it to other people. Uh, at the time I wrote this slide up, uh, varying from 10 milli IU to 1,000 milli IU, we had a 32.3%, uh, even in cleavage media, but it's 35% now. Klaus Anderson had a 31% with 100 milli IU of LH, actually, and, uh, 10, uh, and, and, and 75 milli IU of FSH, uh, and he had 31%. Seegers, who's one of the really fantastic brains in this whole field in Brussels, uh, was able to get 39% with 75 milli IU uh, with using Minipur on 100 milli IU of HCG. Uh, but he added, since the Minipur had so little HCG, he added his own 100 milli IU of HCG to the Minipur. And as I said, Hayashi uh, went with uh, 1200 milli IU per ml, and he got a very good maturation rate of 30%. Uh, now, Anderson went so far as to see if these uh, um, eggs were euploid or likely to be normal and in humans. And 64% with the next generation sequencing were euploid. Of course, we all know the, uh, the error rates, which are up to 40% in trying to do uh, PGTA on uh, biopsies of trophectoderm. But that wasn't what this was. This was looking at the oocyte. And at the oocyte, you can expect the NGS evaluation to be very accurate. And having 64% euploid is, is no different than you get in a egg donor, really, a 20-year-old egg donor. And the M2 rate was uh, one in three, and resulting in a total number of metaphase two oocytes that was similar to the number obtained after ovary stimulation. Just to show you, you know, it's a long time before these people come back to really see if these oocytes are really going to result in a baby. The same way with ovary tissue, it's only because we started so early in 1997 that we have such a large series now 
because it takes a long time to get these cases. But these are very instructive. In night, two, as early as 2014, uh, there was a uh, healthy baby uh, coming from uh, Singapore uh, from ovary tissue GV that was uh, in vitro uh, mature. Uh, Uzilac, uh, in all places, of Louisville, Kentucky, under Steve Nakajima, uh, they had the same thing. I mean, this is a long time ago, uh, and, and no one really knew what they were doing, really. There wasn't much knowledge, but they were still able to uh, get a healthy baby uh, from this uh, ovary tissue, uh, the cryopreserved for five years. And then Seegers, of course, who's the master of this, first reported in 2015 about their results with uh, IVM. And, uh, and then finally, they reported in 2020, several years ago, uh, live births following fertility preservation using in vitro maturation of ovary tissue oocytes. So, I mean, when, it, when it's been tried, it's pretty evident that these oocytes are good oocytes and result in babies. So this is the big question. Why doesn't it require special IVM media and why does IVM actually work? Why is it so easy? Well, GV oocytes dissected from ovary tissue, I've already said, have, be have already become myotically competent in vivo by what we term IVD and IVG. And I'll explain some of Hayashi's work in a, in a little bit before my time is up. Uh, but clearly there are GV oocytes in the ovary tissue all the time uh, that have become myotically competent because of exposure first to IVD for four months, and then to IVG for 11 days. But furthermore, so it's, they're ready. They're 35% they're are ready to be mature. It's not a big deal. But also it's far easier to obtain many GV oocytes from tiny follicles using open cortical dissection than using a needle. And one morning, this won't work if we strip the cumin cells before 24 hours. Also, we, it, it, it's not gonna work. We have more evidence I haven't shown you, but, but it certainly doesn't work in prepubertal ovaries that have had no IVG exposure. Uh, and it doesn't work if initial therapy has been given, they won't even find a GV then. Uh, but in cases where IVM does not work, uh, ovary cortex transplant will work if primordial follicles still remain viable. So this is just a picture. We finished a lot of the work we did uh, in, with Hayashi on my birthday. and. That was us, so that was, we we're celebrating my 75th birth or birthday. And by the way, we celebrate the birthday at eight o'clock at night, and then they all go back to work and they don't stop working till midnight. So you wonder how they can produce such fantastic work. They are workers. So to understand why IVM works, you must understand in vitro gametogenesis. And I've already given you lots of clues to it. So as I, as I told uh, Kyle and Mahmood, uh, you can cut me off at any time when my time is up, because I've given you clues ahead of time about what I'm going to tell you, and I'm just amplifying it now. So this is my humorous slide because you expect Japanese to be short and uh, Americans to be tall, and it's kind of the opposite. So they call me the Y chromosome, and we call him in the, this is in the lab in Kyushu, we call him the X chromosome. And this I showed you before was Ori Hakabi. She no longer works with Hayashi. She's got a job in co commercial work in, in a company, which I think is a shame but she was just a great uh, uh, experimentalist. And of course, Katsuhiko worked with it. He didn't just tell her what to do. Every hour that she was there till midnight doing these, uh, uh, these cultures, he was there with her. Now, this is the original paper you can look up not so long ago from 2016. And this is how you're gonna understand IVM, in vitro versus, and you're gonna also understand ovarian longevity from this. So if you look on top in vivo, uh, what you have is PGECs and ogonia that are locked as primordial follicles. You can try to culture these primordial follicles all you want. And unless you're using the special approach that uh, uh, Nagamatsu finally developed in Hayashi's lab, you're not going to be successful. You might come up with an Egbert or something, but you're just not going to be successful because those primordial follicles ovary. The ovary is in the fetus, the oocytes uh, entered meiosis, and the baby girl would be born with no eggs if it wasn't arrested. It's arrested because they enter the tough ovarian cortex, which causes the FOX3 to go intracellular and causes the nuclei to rotate. And as long as those nuclei are rotating, and as long as FOX3 is intranuclear, that primordial follicle is locked. 
And the only way they're recruited, like a thousand uh, a month, eventually resulting in depletion and menopause at age 51, is a pressure gradient in the ovary. That's the only thing that happens. There is no hormonal control. I'll tell you later that it does require eight core genes to do this, but the trigger mechanism is pressure. Now, if you look below in vitro, you can understand better the various stages of oocyte development and why IVM is so successful, so easily successful uh, with human ovarian tissue. You have these PGCs that were fairly easily made uh, from uh, embryonic stem cells, and they go through this stage called IVD, which means they're incubated with fetal somatic cells or fetal granulosa cells for three weeks. In the human, this is about a four month uh, process. And that's how you get secondary follicles. And then there's 11 days of exposure to gonadotropin. And after that, then you can get a mature M2 oocyte just with one day of exposure to HCG or to LH. So these are the comparative in vivo and evo. And, and you understand how the ovary works in vivo only by understanding in vitro. Now here is the original publication showing again 21 days for in, in vitro differentiation and 11, he has 11 to 14 days, but I'll get into that in a minute uh, for IVG, because if you go more than 11 days, now we know that you'll get post-mature oocytes. And IVM, that is just one day. And uh, now I'll summarize it briefly and you only wanna look because of time at the bottom three lines. There are the three weeks of in vitro differentiation, IVD, and that's equivalent to going from primordial follicle to secondary follicle in the human over four months. And then you have 11 days. You see now he knows from studying this that it's 11 days. 11 days of FSH culture, which we call IVG, and then one day of HCG. By the way, it's good to use a, continue with FSH when you expose it to HCG, and that's IVM. So now we'll go back to my simple chart that tries to ex explain this in the human. You're gonna have 11 days of IVG, gonadotropin sensitivity, that can result in the possibility of a maturation to M2. But only four out of those 11 days uh, are gonna work. They're in the sweet spot because you've had at least seven or eight days of exposure, which you need. But you know, it's a dynamic process in the ovary. So there'll be, oh, there'll be Oocytes that are still in IVD, oocytes that have not gone through seven or eight days of IVG yet, and oocytes that have gone through more than 11 of days of IVG, and they're post-mature, and they're the ones that will degenerate when you try to do IVM. Those are the ones that degenerate when you do regular IVF. So this is a constantly changing daily dynamic. In vivo, once the oocytes have completed IVG, they are meiotically competent and ready for HCG or the LH surge. It's a constant daily process. At any time, a certain number of oocytes in the ovary have completed IVG, are ready for IVM, and that's 35%. Now, again, I'll remind you that it all begins with PGC specification here in the epiblast, and then those PG-specified cells have to migrate. Uh, they have to originate outside of the somatic differentiation of the embryo, as John McCary originally taught me, he gets great credit for that. And then they migrate up to the dorsal ridge where they meet the primordial gonad. And if it's going to be an ovary, these oocytes will have already become PGCs. And the only way they're gonna not, can, the only way, and they're gonna be exposed uh, to fetal granulosa cells. And the only way they're not gonna continue developing and die off uh, before the baby's born is if they are arrested by the pressure of the cortex. And, and actually, uh, Klaus Anderson showed this in mice a long, long time ago, like 15 years ago, that the, o the ogonia that are in the center of the, o of the ovary, where the tissue is loose, they all die off. The only oocytes that survive and are the ones that are in the cortex because they're under pressure from the primordial follicle. Now in vitro, this is just the in vitro culture of these uh, PGCs with uh, fetal granulosa cells in the mouse. And then in order to get exposed, this is not like in vivo. So to expose them to the uh, IVG phase, you have to really separate them off uh, after those three weeks so they can get exposed in vitro. And there you can see those are 
beautiful oocytes. They even come out on a stalk after a separate exposure to IVG. And this is a diagram that'll show you again something that has great clinical application. On the left, you see that that GV oocyte has had not enough exposure to FSH and none to HCG. And it is not out on a stalk. It begins to try to come out on a stalk after the end of FSH exposure, but doesn't complete it until HCG exposure. And there are the first healthy babies born from the skin cells of their mother. And so why does IVM work? It's much easier to collect many GVs from these tiny follicles with the ovary in hand instead of a needle. And 35% of these Gs have already been made myotically competent from in vivo exposure to FSH. And it's not really 10 to 14 days. Now we know it's seven to 11 days. And after that, they become uh, post-mature. And that again is the diagram that explains it that I've talked about already. And um, uh, this is a little bit repetitious. So I'm gonna run through that if you uh, allow me to. Um, okay, I'm gonna make a powerful point here that is gonna be very controversial. So new VGs are appearing daily after finishing IVD and are gonadotropin sensitive. But GVs that have not finished IVG cannot be expected to yield fertile oocytes. And GVs that are overripe also cannot be expected to produce fertile oocytes. And the only reason in nature for the ovulatory cycle, as well as IVF stimulation when we do IVF, is to get the egg out of the ovary. Stimulation is not necessary for maturing the egg. It's already happening in vivo. The only reason is to get the oocyte out. So why do we need ovary stimulation or even the normal ovulatory cycle? And this is my strong argument for minimal stimulation. We have, the, we have four to five times higher baby rate per egg with minimal stimulation than with maximal high dose stimulation, which is what most IVF centers use. We do not need ovarian stimulation for oocyte maturity. FSH has already created GVs with meiotic competence. Do not even need the normal ovulatory cycle for meiotic competence of GVs. Only need ovarian stimulation or ovulatory hormonal cycle for follicle enlargement and either monoovulation, which we have as humans, or oocyte retrieval. So in vitro gametogenesis and IVM reveal the limited role of the ovulatory cycle and ovarian stimulation, other than simply exit the oocyte from the ovary. So my next point would be, what is it that determines ovarian longevity? My time is virtually up, but I will show you a couple of interesting graphs in the last minute or two. We first got clued into this and talked to Katsuhiko about it when we looked at the relative FSH and AMH levels post-operatively of our transplant cases. First, the fresh identical twins, then the frozen ones. And now you'll see with our fresh aloe transplants, which are very exciting. When the FSH comes down to normal by about four or five months, that's when the AMH goes to way high levels and then goes down to low levels. So there's an over-recruitment at the time of the transplant because of a decrease in pressure of follic primordial follicles, which results in really a lower ovarian reserve in these transplant cases. But as I said before, Yasui showed that the lower ovarian reserve, the lower the rate of follicle recruitment. So these things with a low AMH will last for up to eight years. But this is my first idea of pressure being important. Now look at what, this is very recent, our first aloe transplant to uh, a Turner syndrome girl uh, using the uh, Barnes, I'll say Barnes Hopkins because frankly Hopkins got this from Barnes Hospital. It really was a St. Louis protocol before they robbed our fantastic uh, uh, <laughs> nephrologist, uh, Dan Brennan. But at any rate, uh, you see the FSH coming down in the red line. It took a little longer than I had hoped, but by 168 days, it's coming down to good normal levels. But that's the same time that you see the AMH going up. And I believe as we follow this girl for the next year or two, we'll see the AMH come down but that ovary tissue will continue to work for up to eight years. It's only one third of the ovary tissue anyway. And so when she runs out, we can just put another piece of tissue there and have the same result. So my time is up now. And I just think this exciting graph, I wanted to be able to show that to point out whether it's frozen ovary tissue, fresh tissue, syngenetic tissue, or an allograft, it's the same pressure related phenomenon 
plus I haven't shown you yet, eight core genes that are necessary as downstream genes uh, once uh, FOX3 is uh, exited from the nucleus related to decrease in pressure. So uh, I think now we have 15 minutes for questions and thank you very much for inviting me to discuss all this new stuff. Well, uh, thank you, Sherman, for an inspiring talk. This is really terrific. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Um, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and turn your face on too. Uh, I will also try to monitor the chats if people would uh, like to type questions in there. Dr. Silver, this is Gina from Mercy Hospital just down the road from you. Um, can you hear me? Gina, yes. Now, my hearing is terrible, okay. so speak slowly and carefully. Okay. Uh, now, Gina is one of our collaborators in St. Louis at the Mercy Hospital, and they've made it possible for us to do most of this work after our initial work. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate you all. Um, okay, so my question is, I, I was listening to another um, institution talk about the... Um, uh, pubertal um, ovaries and how those have to be dissected differently. Are you finding any difference between pre-pubertal ovaries and post-pubertal ovaries and, and dissecting them differently? You know, my hearing isn't good. Kyle, could you hear that well and then explain to me what Gina said? I'm sorry, I was writing a note. So um, can you repeat it again? I'm sorry, this time I'll listen. Sure. Is there a difference between prepubertal ovaries versus postpubertal ovaries, and is are they dissected differently? Well, that time I heard it well. I th I think we're gonna in the pubertal ovaries, uh, prepubertal ovaries, we're gonna get GVs, but they're not gonna mature because they've had no exposure to um, gonadotropin. Uh, but uh, but the G they will not mature, and it'll be trickier. I think we should freeze those GVs. We should definitely vitrify them uh, and, uh, and figure out over time. It'll, it'll, be, a, a, it'll be probably 11 day culture uh, to expose them first to FSH and then at the right time to uh, HCG, just the way Hayashi does. Uh, we'd have to do what Hayashi does. And uh, I'm sure we can do that in the future. Right now we're not doing that. So I think those GVs should just be frozen and we wouldn't, we should not expose them to HCG because they're not gonna mature and the HCG could gum things up. Um, but uh, so that was about pre -pubertal. What was the rest of that question? I, I, Hello. Go ahead, Gina. Uh, sorry, um, and I'm in a patient care area so I'm not able to turn on my video. Um, so anyway, the I just I just heard of another institution that um, dissects the prepubertal ovary differently. There's something about the medulla, um, like it either doesn't have a medulla or it does. I don't know, um, um, and how that's different than the uh, postpubertal ovary. And I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. Well, no, we we, we do it the same. Now, you know, if you have a Turner syndrome, that's a different story, or a little tiny three-year-old's uh, ovary, uh, you're not gonna have very much of a medulla. It's just gonna be almost, it's gonna be almost all, seem like almost all cortex, but you do have to thin it out and you have to do the dissection microsurgically. Um, the only difference is not in the technique for a little three-year-old's ovary. The only difference is in what the ovary looks like. It's a really small little thing uh, with, with incredible number of uh, with, it's an incredible number of oocytes stuck in that cortex, and there's there's hardly any medulla, but there is some, and so you've got to thin that out uh, so that what you're dealing with is strictly uh, cortex and thin cortex, and then you can vitrify that. Did I see that Dr. Leach had his hand raised, and then I'll read a couple from the uh, comments. Rick, did you have a question? If not, I'll go to the comments. Okay, so we have a question from Li Yang and the question is, um, are there any age restrictions to harvest the ovary um, for later transplantation? 
Okay, now there are no age restrictions, and I must say that um, our, our collaboration with Mercy in St. Louis has been fantastic because uh, they're willing to do this on a child as young as six months old. So there is no pediatric cancer uh, that they, they won't take the ovary out so we can freeze it. And these are going to be incredible ovaries. Uh, I mean, we just did a four-year-old with rhabdo, and uh, I talked to the to the mother and father last week on Zoom. And uh, it's, it's really amazing. I, she's going to be so fertile <laughs> with four-year-old eggs, my gosh. So, uh, so there, there's no age restriction when they're, when they're young. Yeah. I assume there's an upper age restriction. Uh, what is, what's the oldest that you would cryopreserve? Well, okay, our, you know, we'd be willing to do it for older women that are over 35, uh, because who knows? I mean, some of them will high, I mean, they, some of them will be okay. I mean, why not? Uh, but we have to uh, counsel them that their results will be worse because they're already, they're already over 35. <laughs> but uh, we certainly would, we wouldn't have an age restriction. Even if they're 40, we would do it if they wanted to do it. But we'd warn them the intrinsic problem with uh, older oocytes. I have a question from Mary Zielinski. Uh, she asked, uh, have you correlated GV oocyte diameter within the COC with IVM success? Uh, if the oocytes are less than 120 microns in diameter, they may not mature or fertilize. Well, she's absolutely right because they haven't had an adequate period of exposure uh, to IVG, we call it. Uh, they, they would have had less than seven days of exposure to IBG, so they certainly haven't gone through their full growth. Now, now really most of the growth uh, is going to be occurring anyway uh, during the IVD phase from primordial follicle to GV. You could see that on that slide I showed you. That's where most of the growth is occurring, but there's some further growth that's occurring during IVG, of course. Um, but we don't care because we're gonna culture them all and uh, whatever goes to M2, we're gonna, we're gonna freeze. I have another question from Miguel Russo. Um, he, he asks, uh, do you think it's possible to cryopreserve very small segments of ovarian tissue retrieved transvaginally using a biopsy needle similar, similar to those used for liver or kidney biopsies? Well, surely you could biopsy the ovary tissue transvaginally. Um, I, I, I don't see any advantage to that uh, because then you want to do, when you want it, well, there are two reasons. One is, you really want to be able to dissect a decent piece uh, for freezing and for transplanting back on top of the uh, defunct medulla uh, later on when you do it later. Uh, and it, it's not much of a procedure uh, to harvest an ovary. Uh, I know at Mercy Hospital, it's just not a big deal. They do a laparoscopy and, and a little baby and they have the ovary out in 10 minutes. And it's probably, probably easier and it's probably going to be better tissue than what you could get transvaginally. Um, so I have a question. Uh, it was fun to see the stories of your patients who've come back and had successes with their transplanted ovarian tissues and you described one patient who was pregnant with twins and that would make a total of four babies from her transplanted tissues. Uh, my question is were all of those babies from the same uh, tissue transplantation or did she come back and have a second transplantation uh, well, to have the later babies? Fantastic question. So we have one, uh, one leukemia patient who already has five babies from just one piece of tissue and she's got three pieces of tissue still in the freezer. And she happens to be uh, Orthodox Jewish. And so she's going to want to have 20 or 30 babies if she possibly can. <laughs> and she will be able to have that uh, because, uh, I mean, just from this one piece of tissue, she already has five. Now, for the one that I showed the video, I don't have the video of all these people because you got to think of doing a pre-video and then 20 years later do a video. So of the one that you saw, uh, no, uh, the, first, uh, the first two babies she had, were from separate transplants of tissue. And because it didn't last that long and she's, uh, she had adhesions, we had a lice, but then the twins were with her final transplant of tissue. Uh, that's where she got twins. And how long uh, in your hands uh, have you seen uh, ovarian function after transplantation? Well, like I say, we've seen it so far up to eight years. 
uh, it's never less than four years. But you know, a lot of modern women, you know, not to say orthodox, they have their baby and they want to wait four years. And by then it's possible that their ovary isn't so great anymore. And then we put another piece of ovary back. But if you're willing to have them right in a row, uh, well, there are two things happening. One is, of course, you're not waiting for your tissue to run out. But the other thing is, I, I didn't get to show this. I, I could give another talk that we were doing on ovarian longevity. It's clear that pressure is the thing. Multiples, women that get pregnant, when they are pregnant, it's been shown that during pregnancy, at least after the first trimester, the AMH uh, goes down. And, uh, and then uh, three months after they deliver, the AMH goes up again. Furthermore, Terramoto in a different study has like 25,000 Japanese women showing what happens to the AMH with age over time. And he was able to find with patients that were pregnant, uh, the AMH stayed, uh, the AMH before pregnancy and after, after delivery, the AMH stayed up and didn't go down over time. So that it's pretty clear that multiparity or being pregnant causes an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, which allows your ovary to survive for longer. So our time is getting close. And so I'll finish up with one last question from Veronica Gomez Lobo. Um, she asks, uh, you mentioned Turner's ovaries. Are you cryopreserving ovaries that have a streak appearance? We've been uh, cryopreserving Turner's uh, patients, uh, Turner's ovaries, and we have no idea how good this is gonna be uh, in the future. But what I'm more excited about now, really excited is I think we can successfully do aloe transplants to those Turner's girls, uh, either from a sister or a cousin. And it's possible based on the work with kidney transplantation, even to do it from a friend who isn't related. So I'm not as excited about freezing the Turner's. I'd like to freeze them really, really. There was a really good study, I'm sorry, coming out from Amsterdam and I'm forgetting his name, in which he showed if they were Turner mosaics, it was worth freezing them early. If they weren't Turner's mosaics, uh, his results weren't good. Well, thank you, Dr. Silver, not only for an excellent presentation, but also a great discussion uh, after. Really, really appreciate uh, your knowledge and your experiences over a, over a long and productive career. Thank you very much, Kyle. I really appreciate this society and you're inviting me and I wanna be real active with it. I will add, thanks to what you say, I believe I'm the oldest living full-time practicing infertility doctor in the world. <laughs> that has certain advantages. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And thank you all uh, for attending this webinar. Thank you. You have any final words of wisdom, Mahmoud? 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 I would like to thank Dr. Selva and uh, Dr. Kyle Orway and Dr. Mendy Christiansen for uh, attending this webinar. I was busy <laughs> organizing <laughs> the recording and uh, uh, the participants. I enjoyed it so much. And uh, I would like to have more webinars with you, uh, Dr. Selva, in the near future when you have time. And uh, I think uh, everybody enjoyed today. Well, that's it. I appreciate that. If you, I can also, I can give a more full uh, talk on uh, ovarian longevity and uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the various genes that really are responsible for primordial follicle development, and um, and even where we're going in the future, uh, because now Hayashi has actually shown that you can create fetal granulosa cells with a very complex culture system that he says is simple because he's worked it out in, in, the, in the mice, but, to that, it, but it's species specific. So in the human, it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult, but um, uh, we can talk about, in fact, but rather than me just talking, I've got, I, I can compare it to IVM and the human ex transplant experience, but you really gotta have Amanda and Kyle come on to talk about this because it's really, and Hayashi, of course, it's fantastic stuff will be very interested, of course, and uh, I would work to organize uh, future webinars with you when you have time, we'll, be, we'll keep in contact uh, over the next uh, yeah, few, few weeks. That would be great. We're ready to do it. Now, one thing I'll warn you, um, 
July 23rd, I'm going to be off the grid till August yeah. the 10th. And then I go to the Gordon Conference with Kyle. So yeah. the next few weeks wouldn't work, but any time after August 19th works. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay. So Dr. Christiansen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Silver. This was such a treat. Um, I really enjoy, I always enjoy listening to your talks and this is great. And I can't wait until hopefully part two um, coming up soon. Thank you very much. I can't wait either. It's a I really enjoy you guys. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Serba, again. And see you again in the next uh, webinars. Have a great day. Okay, bye thank bye. you. you. You too, for sure.